So welcome to this week's edition of Beers and Bites with our co-host, Chris Jordan of Fluency Security and Jeremy Murdishaw from Fortify 24-7. This week's special guest is Greg Edwards, who is the CEO of Crypto Stopper. And they focus a lot on doing automated ransomware stopping, right, of active attacks that are in the system. And you're going to learn some very intriguing things about how they do that and how it actually can help benefit the different companies that are out there looking to help protect themselves from ransomware. So with that, uh, gentlemen, why don't, Chris, why don't we start with you? Since we only have one Chris on this episode, uh, show off your beer for the evening. So I'm still in my Lent, so it's, I'm down to my single beer. So I got some Regime from uh, a joint brewery, and it's solid. Now it's a triple hop IPA. We go into this triple hazy. We can go and have a discussion over hazies sometime. And then this is a triple, which is kind of bizarre. Um, it's got five different hops. I don't know why they call it a triple. It's only at 10%. Um, anyways, Jeremy, go oh, ahead. So I, I see now the game is if I go to one beer, i got to make sure that I'm at least 10% alcohol, if not 20%. Exactly. That, so that covers for the three beers that you normally would have had by the end of the show. For you, it should be like an extra couple because it's by weight. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you're six six you do carry a few pounds with you <laughs> so jeremy go ahead and, and just show your beers for this evening i'm also going with the uh, triple ipa it's a ten and a half percent from uh, barrier brewing it's called stunton it's got this uh pretty cool looking uh, can artwork Sweet. little dude on there yeah, the guy looks like the guy looks like you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Almost for, leprechaun territory, I guess. And, and for a uh, hey, I'm six three. <laughs> uh, and for uh, Chris's second beer, I'm having the Prohibition Ale. Oh, that's that's good. I should be on Thanks. Prohibition. Speakeasy yeah. is that? Is it Speakeasy Brewery? Yeah, it's Speakeasy. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Greg, what would you bring this evening, sir? So, I brought a hazy, hazy IPA we that is them. from Big Grove Brewery, and it is Easy Eddie. So, being Greg Edwards, my, my nickname in high school was Eddie. And so, this is my new favorite beer, Easy and Eddie. And that's local to Iowa, yes? Uh, local to Iowa, yeah, out of Solon, Iowa, which is just about five miles south of, of my house. Nice, nice. Yeah, you know, in, in Texas here, we definitely have a lot of different breweries. But, of course, my favorite one is more on the you know, vodka side with Tito's. But that's a different story. <laughs> so for this evening, uh, what I brought is an Alaskan uh, ale this time around. And it's the uh, Amber. So it's an alt-style ale. And just it's not that uh, 10% Whopper. Yeah, I yeah. feel like Al, I feel like we're we're weak here. I think mine is five point six. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can drink twice as much then. There you go. I'm telling right? you for sure. <laughs> Cheers. But, yeah. Cheers. So with that, uh, Cheers. Greg, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and and what you do with Crypto Stopper. I know I kind of alluded to that up front, but uh, give us a little more detail, please. Yeah. So so I actually used to own an offsite backup and disaster recovery company that I ended up selling to a company called J2 Global in 2016. Um, and one of the reasons that I sold it was because of the, the, the problem of ransomware. So 20% of our clients between 2012 and 2015 were hit by ransomware and needed full-on recovery. So um, it seemed pretty obvious to me that this issue of ransomware was, was going to continue. Uh, and so actually, when I after I sold Axis Backup, um, intended to start a full-on MSSP and decided that was too much of a hassle. <laughs> in, in the process of that, we, we wanted to build a tool specifically to stop ransomware that would, would stop ransomware once it was actually running. So once it got past all of the other tools. Um, and we built it, first of all, as just a PowerShell script. And what it's evolved into now is a system of bait files that we put out, you call them, you call them 
canary files or honeypot files, but we deploy these bait files throughout the network and then we monitor those files for the ransomware and encryption activity. So, it, I mean, in a nutshell, that's, that's it. It's actually not that complicated. Um, it's a pretty simple and elegant solution to be able to detect and stop ransomware that's so running. once you once you detect that activity what is it that you necessarily do then with your yep. application to kill that ransomware yep so depending and that's the that's the unique and different thing that we do is we actually take take action on that ransomware that's running so if it's on a network we'll isolate the the machine that's running the ransomware um, if it is on an individual, so we have a desktop and a, a server version, if it's actually running at the desktop, kill the process that's running the encryption, no matter whether that's, um, if it's using, if it's a fileless ransomware and leveraging something that's local on the machine, then we'll kill whatever that process is. And, and do you have any way of identifying the source of that process so that it, that can be blocked? So we do. Yep. Yep. So we identify the, we identify the source or at least the, not necessarily the source being like the IP address or where it's coming from on the net, but we identify the actual process that's running and notify the, the network admin or the security admin of what that is, uh, what files, because I, I, the one issue with, with the way that we do it is that some files are still going to get encrypted. Um, our average time to detection and action is less than a second. So it's typically somewhere between five and 15 files that are hit, but we also catalog what those files are and send that all out as part of the notification. You sure, call them sure. like one, 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 AA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get well, in the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, ransomware typically, typically will go A to Z, but it doesn't always, sometimes it'll, it'll jump around. Um, and so we definitely do start a bit, but then we also uh, make sure that, because sometimes they'll go randomly, sometimes they'll go Z to A, sometimes they'll start in the middle. It just depends. So, so you know, just out of curiosity, do you detect things that aren't ransomware? Because um, of so we, we do have some false positives and we have a whitelisting system. So we can go in and whitelist applications because there are, um, it's typically more directory specific where, you know, like a different updates for specific applications will go and encrypt or decrypt files and, and trigger, trigger our software. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to go from, you know what, I should do this. I should stop and start from the very beginning thinking that people are listening in their layman's on this whole thing. So everybody kind of understands ransomware encrypts, right? So what are the other things that ransomware does uh, that people don't really think about? Yeah, what, is, so, what is the danger of ransomware besides things encrypting? Yeah, so I mean, at the core, that's what it does, right? I mean, it just encrypts. You think of a, an application like WinZip, um, it literally just encrypts the files, but then puts that password on it that the company that's being hit doesn't know, and they have to pay to get that encryption code. Um, but the other things that ransomware does now, um, we started seeing about three years ago, where as part of their scripts and part of the application, they would go and look for network attached backup and wipe out the backups. So that's been a, a very common, um, common thing where they'll actually either encrypt or delete the, the backups themselves. Um, they're also starting to exfiltrate the data. So they'll not only encrypt the files locally, but then send the data off site and ransom the company to say, you know, either pay us or we're going to release this data. Not only do we, do you not have your data, but now we have your data and we're going to release it on the dark web. Yeah. One of, one of the things that, that, we you know recently learned about was this notion of the U.S. Treasury Department, right? If you pay ransomware, you could be making illegal payments to terrorist organizations, and therefore you have got to work with the FBI and with the Treasury Department if you think you're going to make a payment to make sure that it would be legal. You just now, took Jeremy's thunder. I'm sorry, Jeremy, but you know it reminds me of last year. I think it was with Garmin. They got hit. 
And not only did they get hit and locked up, but their backup data got clobbered, yep. which to me is a different yep. story because you should have that rule of three for backup where you have isolated real-time backup that are you know disconnected and can't be affected but that's a different absolutely story. well and when you talk about backups i mean so i come from the backup and disaster recovery world prior to starting crypto stopper and we we had a really cool um system where we would take and back up these systems and put it into a distributed computing solution that was off-site which now we call the cloud um but started that before the Um, back up in two hours or less, but it's still a massive disruption for the company because you go, I mean, especially, you know, in, in 2012, when you were taking a company that had never even heard of the cloud and you switch them completely over to now everything is, is in the cloud and you have to work from the cloud. I, it just hugely disrupting, even when you have a great And I think, solution. you know, one of the things that, that bothers me in particular is that businesses don't think about what's the impact of my business to be down per hour, right? Imagine right. An, even local dentist's office, if they're down for a day, right? Maybe that's 10, 15, $20,000 that they lose in potential business. And they look at forms that are out there and they sell it's too expensive. Yeah. And that's, that's been the case. I mean, I think, I think what's changed since 2012. So 2012 is the introduction of Bitcoin. And so we really have not even had quite 10 years now that these attackers can get paid for what they do. And that's been the massive change in the, in cybersecurity in general. Um, but business owners haven't adjusted yet. They haven't figured out that uh, antivirus and firewall aren't enough anymore. And so adjusting those bid budgets, and I mean, people asking, well, what's the ROI if I install this? Well, how, <laughs> it's, it's hard to justify, right? So we as cybersecurity professionals have to be able to show them what that business risk is because there's not, there's not an ROI it's eliminating business risk. Well, so, you know, that's a good point. I mean, so in our industry, now for like 30 years, I've heard this ROI discussion around security. It's a cost center. And we never look at return on investment for a cost center, but somehow somebody out there wants to have a ROI discussion on security. I, I don't comprehend it. That's like having an ROI discussion on your insurance policy, right? Um, it's crazy. Well, I mean, and that it, what's my ROI for my life insurance? I'm freaking dead. Okay. Right. Different F word, by the way. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and I think that that's the, that's the big change in those discussions that have, has to happen is it's around business risk and not ROI. Well, a lot of businesses with the statements that you made earlier, uh, we are seeing that hands down now with the exfiltration of client data, right? You take the legal firms back in New York that got extorted and their clients were being extorted. We've had, uh, I've seen notes where psycho uh, psychotherapy firms out of, I think it was Denmark Norway. or Norway got hacked, right? And now the patients are being held for extortion. And yeah. the way that I could potentially translate ROI is, Listen, if you can give your clients confidence that you are protecting their data from exfiltration, right, or being breached, will that not in return help you have potential differentiation over other businesses and maybe even help you grow that business? So, so stop right there. So, so, Greg, we're really talking to you and I know you're going to say something and I just interrupted. That's all right. <laughs> um, I'll just so, drink. Yeah, just keep drinking. Um, so, so. What I want you to do is, is phrase this response in a certain way. I want to know, how do you, listen, it, it's, it makes sense to scare the crap out of people and say, now buy our crap, right? But, but really, how do you pitch your, your product today? And how has that pitch changed? Because if you're like any entrepreneur, you're changing your pitch every three or four weeks. So can you give me the evolution of your pitch? 
Yeah. So early on, uh, the pitch was much more toward you don't have to rely on backup. We're like ransomware is such a problem. Install Crypto Stopper. You don't have to worry about ransomware. You don't have to worry about going to your backups. And what's changed now, we've gone to a, a fully channel partner. So we're only selling to um, resellers, so managed service providers. And the pitch to them is don't, I mean, they've all, every MSP that I've talked to in the last two years has dealt with ransomware within their client base. And so it's eliminating the risk for them of going out and having the discussion with their clients about why did we get hit by ransomware? Because every client of an MSP thinks they're protecting me. And it's not, it's not the case. And with ransomware, it's something where when you think about what ransomware does, it's no different than any malware that all of us have dealt with in the last 20 years, other than the damage that it does. So if you think back to pre-2010 and a client would get some kind of malware infection, you re-image the machine, put it back on the network, it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't work anymore. I mean, you can't, if it's ransomware, then there's huge damage. And if it's not ransomware, then it's some kind of advanced persistent threat that you got to go figure out where's it gone laterally. So those the, the days have changed from malware infections just being an, an annoyance and a nuisance to now being a whole new level of, of threat and damage. So, so really what you're saying is, is, is you, first of all, your target isn't really necessarily the end customer as much as is an Correct. intermediate MSSP. And that Correct. what you're doing is turning to the MSSP and saying, listen, your life's about to suck and we're going to help you make it less sucky. Right. Yep. And, and yep. so, and now it, it, you brought up a, another piece, you know, I have so many questions, Jeremy, you can jump in, just do a timeout when you want me to jump, when you want to jump in sometime, or you can just eat some Cheetos or something, if that's what you got there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so you, you were talking about lateral movement and, and, and I want to go back to the statement that you talked about before about the increases in malware sophistication. And, and, and one thing, yep. my personal opinion is, is that, listen, this is a, a piece of malware, the first thing I would do if I was in exploit you is I'd put a rat on there, a remote admin yeah. tool, right? Or Absolutely. remote access tool. Yep. And yep. so Trojan. Yeah. yeah, it was some way to control the device. And, and then I would move laterally. I'd do as much control prior to making my move that it can be seen. Yeah. Right. So so yep. is and that some of it works better if a human's behind it. Some of it is good automated. What have you seen as far as the sophistication in that direction, as far as yeah. a really rat oriented, I'm going to take everything I can. Yeah. So Ryuk, which is one of the most prolific, still one of the most prolific ransomware. Absolutely. Um, and they've made, they've made $150 million. So they're not going to stop or they're maybe they'll retire and say, Do you think they're going to IPO anytime soon? <laughs> they might. They <laughs> might. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the so what Ryuk is doing now is actually using a worm to use wake on land to then go through spread the laterally. rest, yeah, to spread laterally throughout the rest of the network. And I don't know, you know, I don't know what the intent is beyond ransomware, but absolutely people have to think about that. It's extortion. That's what the intent is, yeah, right? Yeah. If I can get more of, if I can compromise more of your machine, machines before I start encrypting your files, then I own you forever. Now, what am I going to yeah. do next? Maybe I'll just ask you for 10% of your company. What are you going to say? No? Right. Yeah. Kind of like organized crime on the streets of New York, on Chicago. Exactly. You got to pay protection. I'm protecting well, you from other malware that's going to come and get you. And I, and I think that that's what business owners have to think about is that this isn't, this isn't some hacker sitting in his mom's basement anymore. This is organized crime. And these guys are making so much money that the, the organized crime syndicates that used to do human trafficking and drug trafficking are still doing those things, but now they've added cybercrime to the repertoire because it's so profitable. 
So and, and, and the chances of getting caught are so much oh, less. It, yeah. There's so much less risk. Yeah. yeah. Make yeah. more money, less risk, and just hire some some nerds like us. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and hire and slave. What's the difference? Tomato, tomato. Indentured service, all that. So I've been out of the loop for a couple of years on, on malware writing. Um, now, the guys that are writing the ransomware, are anybody selling them as kits? Oh, like, yeah. You know, yeah. In the old days, we used to have the root yep. kits. And you'd, be, you'd buy orange, you'd buy this, you'd buy black hole. Yeah. So, so Ran- nowadays, there are kits Ran- where you can buy it. Yeah. Well, it's actually it's, ransomware as a service. As a service, yeah. Yeah. But not yeah. as a kit. So so, so the, the reason why I say that is because what was making the, the kits so powerful was I could sell them to all these people in third world countries. And, and I was making my money just selling it. There was no, the law would never well, come after me. But Chris, why not get a little piece of every yeah, transaction? Pain, pain I, I see what you're saying. <laughs> Do it as a service. But yeah. But I mean, yeah. it, it, so that's a better model, huh? The so, so, service model has proven itself time and time some, again. Some Harvard grad who said, I can do this better. I can make this a SaaS model. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, really, what's happening is somebody is locked up in Siberia or wherever these guys are. Iran, Siberia, China. Why are right? you picking bad places to live? I'm thinking, well, San Francisco. <laughs> but then again, that's a bad place to live, too. That's How right. about Bahamas? Bahamas. <laughs> the Bahamas. Somebody. Right. And, and, and some bean counter is literally putting a PowerPoint together for their boss and saying, hey, if we did this as a service. We can make twice as much money. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so so now let's talk about the evolution, because I like talking about the evolution, Greg, but I want to go back to a couple of ideas that by the time we're at the end of it, we can discuss things that we probably can patent and no one's going to listen to it anyways. So uh, so when we talk about the lateral movement and, and the malware, uh, so I remember it was, I think the University of Michigan or something had their file shares all encrypted, right? So are you seeing, you, you talked about lateral movement and going for other things, backups, but are you seeing uh, file shares and other things more sophisticated than just, I'm going to, I'm going to take out your PC? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, we've been seeing that since 2012 where they're going laterally because that's where the, I mean, so the very first ransomware that I saw, and I, uh, I, I wish I remember, it might have been CryptoLocker. Um, the ransom was $40. And it, that one was a local local PC. I think it was but, two Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 no doubt. Back then, sure. Uh, but, but then very quickly after 20, 2012, um, we saw those lateral movements, and that's where I was seeing in the offsite backup world, where, you know, wh- whoever Ted the the accounting guy would mm-hmm. open an open an attachment, and it was the first thing it would do would go and look at all of the network shares and go attack those first. So that I saw that happening pretty early on in the evolution because they could then make so much more money. And when I say so much more money, I mean, those first ones, it was, it was $40. And I think when I saw like a $700 one, mm. like, Whoa, $700. And then it went to 1200 and then, you know, 400,000 is a low one now. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 uh, talk a little bit about these, the notion of industrial control systems and what's happening worldwide with that. How, do you see ransomware playing a role there? So I do. So I haven't seen, I haven't been involved in any of those at, at this point, but if you can lock down an entire manufacturing facility, say, or you could lock down a water treatment facility and you could attack all of those um, those industrial control devices then and hold them for ransom, then absolutely. Like I said, I mean, that's, that's not an area. I mean, we focus much more on professional businesses and managed service yeah, and providers. So not personally, personally, Gal, they wouldn't, they brick them. They'd yeah. You, you'd just brick them. You'd just do the, you'd be Jeremy's mafia again. You'd say, listen, I'm here. You delete one of me. I brick the rest of you. So kind yeah. of like that, that incident with the Florida water where they, they released too much chlorine whatever it was into that was more of a terrorist act but yeah i mean that the yeah, reality is the focus is the focus is that you would be more aggressive once 
as a demonstration you have the capability and, and then you hold it hostage. The, the advantage of ransomware is the, the fact that the data they have is, is something valuable and that the, the business owner really at that point has to say, what's more valuable, my time, right? That I can reconstruct that or just paying you off. I mean, I hate to say it, that I still believe that's, that's the business decision to make, whether it, it's ethically right or wrong. Yeah, it is. But, yeah. but again, it's nice to have prevention. And that's why we have Greg here. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, to that point, then the question I would have, Greg, is if companies are deploying your solution, are the underwriters for cybersecurity risk insurance recognizing that and then showing the results back in a reduced premium back to the companies? So not yet. We're, we're, we are working on that. Um, but the thing, so cyber, cyber liability insurance has become uh, much more sophisticated than it was even four or five years ago. So they are starting to take those, those kind of things into consideration, but not, not to the point where they're reducing premiums significantly that I've seen for, for small businesses for the, you know, up to, they may be when you get into the thousands and thousands of employees and enterprise size, but for the less than a thousand employee companies, they're not that sophisticated yet. Interesting. So Jeremy, what were you going to say? Well, I'm going to start asking the nerdy questions. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. The, the, <clears throat> okay. Canary tokens is free. It's an early warning system, right? Yep. Um, how do I, as an MSSP who offers advanced EDR systems to their customer base, why do I, or why should I also include CryptoLocker as part of my product portfolio and delivery? Yep. So Crypto Stopper, not, don't, don't deploy CryptoLocker. <laughs> 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 and, he, and, and Greg, he hasn't even finished his first beer yet. No, no, no. <laughs> that, that's the first 10%. Okay. <laughs> We're working but, on number two. Yeah. So it's the, it's the automation that our algorithm takes. So I'm, I'm absolutely defense in depth, layered security, like has to be done. But what Crypto Stopper is, is that last line of defense. So if it gets past all of the other protections and ransomware is actually running on the network now, then that's where we stop it. And we not only, you know, it, because it's not just about the warning, because if you're getting a warning, it's too late. I mean, how, how quickly are the techs going to respond to it? I mean, if they're really, really awesome and they hit it in 15 minutes or less, then you're only talking, you know, tens of thousands of files. If it's two hours, you're at millions of files. If it's more than two hours, you're done. So it's that it's that time to detection and the automated action that we take. So how how then would you say you fare like in a, if you were to look at a, like Sentinel One or CrowdStrike, which have that same yep. kind of they don't have the 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 honeypot files, but they have that process native, analysis yep. exactly native and yep. they have the they can roll back the pc to its previous yep. state right yep so yeah so we actually integrate with um and we'll ride along with sentinel one um we have them with crowdstrike crowdstrike's typically in much more enterprise larger clients than we're in um and so it's that additional layer with the canary files beyond just the native files uh, because it's it's not at, because sentinel one we integrate with them not going to knock their product but just additional additional security and quicker time to detection and stopping just so another so another blanket so if there it, is some hash that they aren't aware of that the sentinel one's ai cloud doesn't know about yet it's a zero day that nobody knows about, perhaps there's it, a, that crypto stopper will be the, the one to isolate that. Yeah, because we're we're not signature based in any way. So it doesn't matter what what it is that's running, it's gonna stop it. Right. You touch my file, which should never be touched. I'm going to look at you. Exactly. Okay. 
Okay. Interesting. So then there is there a what now I know this is probably a conversation you have with partners at the time, but can you give uh, potential partners out there a an idea of what does this additional layer of protection have to cost? Yeah, what, yeah, where, yeah. Where do you think it retails? Yeah, so I do want to be a little careful about that because it's it is something where they're going to pass that cost on to the end user. But I mean, our pricing goes down to less than a dollar an endpoint. We do um, we do usage tiers as opposed to per endpoint. So we put you in a bucket of if you've got up to a thousand endpoints, or if you're between fifteen hundred and and two thousand. And that pricing gets down to less than a dollar an endpoint. So in worst case, it's 12 bucks a year, it's an extra insurance policy. Maybe as an MSSP, I'm hedging my bets by deploying it and it's not that's something I pass on, for example. Right, and that's, that's yeah. we've priced it low enough that we really want MSPs and MSSPs to be able to just add it to their stack. And say, okay, I'm going to eat that extra thousand bucks a month to be able to deploy that across my yeah. across my client base. So and is the is the is the agents Mac Windows Linux? Is it Windows uh, just Windows, Windows, just Windows right now. Yep. Is Mac is Mac Linux on the roadmap? Yeah, Linux first, and then Mac. Actually, it's Linux from the the standpoint of the file share system, um, and Mac from the the client system. And have you have you considered looking at ways to integrate with like QNAP arrays because they've had a lot of ransomware recently? Uh, yeah, so on not types of technologies, not on our roadmap currently. And I would say, I mean, we have we have a pretty solid roadmap for the rest of 2021, but beyond that, and actually looking more to a licensing model beyond 2021 where we would just license it to a QNAP, let them roll it out. All right, I'm ready for the lightning round. You ready for the lightning round, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me get a drink. All right, all right, let's make this one. So- Chug, uh, chug, chug, chug. chug. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. The first, the first question is lightning round is, uh, so what about people who use SOARS and they say, you know what, I could do the same thing, place a canary and create some magical phantom uh, playbook that's going to say the canary got infected, quarantine that machine. What do you, how do you feel about people who think playbooks do everything? Um, so, I mean, I say go for it, like do it, but <laughs> still, I mean, our system is proven and is going to work. Good. All right. So next, next, next question. Um, this is a lot like deceptive technology, right? Because you're going to deceive the fact that there's a crumb, whether it's a canary, you whatever you want to call it. Um, a TiVo network is definitely, in, we, we talked to those guys, awesome product, right? Um, do you see yourselves migrating into the deception world? So I don't. Um, we, so, I mean, we are deception. We're considered deception technology, but I don't see going and competing in that, in that space. Now, next question, intellectual property. Have you submitted for patents? Uh, I actually, sitting on my desk is the patent application um, that is in a final draft form that's being submitted probably yet tomorrow or next week. So by the time people listen to this, it's submitted. Okay. It, it, it's submitted. <laughs> yep. We'll be patent, we'll be patent pending. So, so next <laughs> question <laughs> then. Next question. We've seen scenarios where some of the more current EDRs have to be connected to the cloud to be 100% effective. So if they're disconnected from the cloud, they're not as effective, right, at, yep. at doing what they're supposed to do. Tell me about your product in relation yeah. to that. So our algorithm and, and agent actually runs on the local machine. So doesn't matter if it, if, because an attacker and the thinking behind that for us is, okay, if the attacker disconnects the network, we still want our solution to work. All next. right, Greg, next question. Uh, things like OneDrive, Office 365, Dropbox, BoxNet, all right, box.com. Yeah. Uh, these are considered uh, backups and other material. Do you have the ability to do the same technique on those type of shares? Uh, 
So we do, and we have deployed that and successfully been able to protect the cloud drives. Sweet. All right. Um, the last uh, one. All right, yeah, wait, wait, on. one more. <laughs> How long have you had your pilot's license and what's the coolest plane you've flown? <laughs> so the coolest plane that I've flown was an open twin, twin engine. Why am I not thinking the name of it? I, I actually own a really cool plane. It's a Lancer 360. It goes, so I could talk for hours on this, but um, probably my own plane would be the, the very coolest one that I've flown because yeah. it, goes 200 and 230 miles an hour um and it's a retractable gear and um now is it officially cool. a um what do you call that experimental craft because it, that allows you to work on it without a certification or yeah whatever? i was actually out at the hangar you probably can't see the oil under my finger on fingernails no, I, on. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I was actually out at the hangar um working on the annual inspection before we started today <laughs> next one so, next one Anybody, you what's that? What's that uh, conference where they all fly in? It's like the yeah, Oshkosh. Oshkosh, do you ever go to Oshkosh? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's did you it ever is. go there? Did you ever go there sober? <laughs> well, <laughs> I always fly sober, so, <laughs> yes, I arrive, I arrive sober. This does so flying do you, do sober have... make a difference, isn't it? Just landing sober. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, pretty much. <laughs> so, so with a 50 acre farm, do you have your own airstrip on there? I don't yet. Um, I don't have enough. There's not enough room, but if I end up buying a piece of property next to me, then I'll have enough room. Yeah, it's not uncommon in some of these areas here in Texas to have your it, own landing strip on. Uh, on property. Yeah, it's actually really common. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing I want to know about is you got to experience some weather phenomenon that we here in Texas have all the time, right? We've got tornadoes, we've got hurricanes, and now we've got these uh, polar vortex ice storms and things that just tear everything apart. Yep. But you yep. got, and I understand that Iowa is, it's normal for Iowa to have these uh, derechos. Yeah. So I would, so this Aren't was they the like only historic dogs, derechos. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, uh, that event was crazy. I mean, coming from the disaster recovery world, I would have not, I mean, it basically was a land hurricane that hit directly hit uh city of Cedar Rapids, which is just North of me a little ways. And I was actually out walking my dogs and on our property, um, I was up on top of a Hill and I could see this. I mean, there were no warnings for this thing. I mean, usually we have, you know, sirens going on that I can hear um, and no, you know, no alert on my phone, but I could see this just wall coming mm -hmm. wall of clouds coming. And I'm like, all right. I, so I start heading for the house and about the time I get the dogs into the house, I mean, this wind is just howling. I guess, I mean, I, I was in the basement. I'm usually the guy out looking out the window is the tornado. Is that the tornado? But <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in the basement in this little, little room that we have where there's a freezer and electrical room. Um, and you could just, I mean, the wind, it was a hundred and, 110 mile out, 110 mile an hour sustained wow. wind. Um, that I mean, in the city of Cedar Rapids, it I mean, it, it's just devastating. I, I understand um, personally because we had an F3 tornado come over our property uh, about two years ago. Yeah, you know, I just yeah. to let you know, Greg, that, that the Catholic Church is considered writing a brand new chapter on Allen, adding it to the Old Testament. Um, <laughs> he's had everything from tornadoes, frogs, ice, yeah. frogs, you name it. It's crazy. It's crazy in Al's little world. It really yeah. is. So I, I wouldn't say that was, no. I wouldn't say that was a common, the derechos are not common. I, there was one other, I did some research and there was one other in recent history that hit Iowa. Um, but I mean, it, it was crazy. 97% of the residents in my county were without power and yes. I was without power for six days. Yes. We understand yeah. that. Trust me. Wow. We, we know yeah. that feeling. Well, yeah. And, well, yeah. In Texas. And, and we, when you have no power, you have no water, you have, if you got yep. wells, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. It, it's, yep. Yeah. And at least it wasn't cold here at that time. So there wasn't, you know, it was, it was just hot and miserable, not, 
cold and miserable. And of course, there so, are all the requisite trees down and, and probably roofs and oh, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 70. So in the city of Cedar Rapids, they estimated somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the canopy gone. Uh, mm-hmm. It's yeah. crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. We've got 200 plus year old oak trees that that when that tornado hit, that literally just, just lead them right over yeah, on their yeah, side. I, yeah. I remember planting those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be on that border of Old Testament to New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, I did have a question. So, so, Greg, as you're going through this, and you, two areas that I'm, I'm fascinated. One is... Do you still do any research and development? I mean, are you guys still looking for new things to do? Yeah, so we do. Um, and and actually, the so the exfiltration is something that we're adding to our system that we haven't yet, that I'm disappointed we haven't already added that. But being able to detect and stop, because a lot of the ransomware will now do that exfiltration first, and we're too late to that game. So, yeah, so detecting that exfiltration and, and cutting that off. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, we're constantly looking at what's coming next. While we're not a signature-based solution, so we don't have to worry about, like, the specific variant, but what are the techniques that they're, they're doing? Do you think, you know, out of, out of a weird question, do you think they're sending it back first because they want a copy before they send it to their SaaS provider that they don't can't, they don't have to keep it. To it. <laughs> well, so they, they actually do that exfiltration first, just because a lot of times, so what, what an IT admin will do when they know a ransomware activity okay. is going on, they'll run in and either shut down the servers or start pulling network cables. Yeah. The good old network cable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not like you're going to pull a trunk line. No. Yeah. So, so the last thing I, you know, and the last little note I had on it was, um, so ransomware that I've seen in the past looks at file extensions, especially on the Windows world, mm-hmm. looks at file extensions and targets particular files to encrypt. So, wouldn't it make sense if you want to do a backup to change the file extension to something that a ransomware wouldn't find? Number one, and then number two is, is have you played around with? When you, when you have your little canaries, I think of the canary files, yep. the naming convention, besides the order, have you thought about uh, hit, using hidden files or changing the permission markers? Uh, are there techniques that you find kind of are too sexy for the crypto to bypass? Yeah, yeah. So we do actually do all of those things. Um, and I don't, I don't want to give away any any. Man, yeah, not that it would matter. Here. You're gonna get the yeah, you're right, right. <laughs> well, I'm thinking more of the attackers, but it really won't matter because what we do, we do random generation of those canary files for every installation, so they're never mm-hmm. static. So we're using um, different attributes and different file extensions, different size on every single installation that we do. Does your yeah, agent I mean- have a specific footprint? on the machine, how much RAM CPU does it take? How much disk space do you use on, on average? Yeah, so the the resource utilization is very low. I mean, so less than 1% CPU utilization. Um, RAM, I mean, it depends on how many files and how, how big the file system is, um, but we might, but it is a, it's a very, um, very small footprint. Is that something that's tunable? So let's say we have a, a resource constrained machine and we have you know only a certain amount of, of RAM specifically like that I can give up. Can I be targeted about which directories I place? So these you can, files in? so yeah, yeah. So it's not as tunable yet as we want, um, but you can tune it by picking which directories you're going to protect. So we're, we're adding additional tuning capabilities so that number of files being deployed, number of um, levels deep that it's deployed, things like that, that you can add additional tuning to. Do you do like syslog output, anything like that? Page or duty uh, integration? Yeah, not yet. Not yet. But on you the road. you get tired now. of people asking you for <laughs> features that really are just... <laughs> 
I've got so much other shit I gotta do. Why are you giving me another feature? <laughs> so no, I don't because That's sometimes we get sometimes we get some great ideas to be like, ah, yeah, we're gonna put that in. <laughs> so uh, one of the questions that, that I wanted to ask earlier was what if the endpoints are running BitLocker? How do how do you play with that? Or does it uh, even matter? Doesn't matter because that I mean at that level, the the files are all encrypted, but they're not encrypted, if that makes sense. Okay. They're, the only time where BitLocker really comes into play is if you think about a laptop being stolen and somebody else trying to log into it and get access to that data. Right. So, And that's something that people don't think about, um, that encryption, an encryption like BitLocker specifically is awesome for if that machine is stolen or an unauthenticated user is on the machine, it's awesome. But typically in a ransomware event, it's an authenticated user that's then going to have access to all of that encrypted data. Yep. As, as an un, unencrypted pr uh, perspective. Correct. Right. And then right. when they exfiltrate it, then it's still unencrypted. It, it's, exactly. It's still, it's still open. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So just I wish the last I would have had a beer for that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the water. <laughs> I'll keep up. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, just please have another one for me. <laughs> well, well, listen, we are nearing the top of the hour. But in, and with that, Greg, I, I do want to say thank you on behalf of the team for a, yeah. actually a very enjoyable yeah. conversation this evening. I would certainly appreciate it. Absolutely. That. Yeah, it was fun. This is the first one of these that I've been able to do with a beer in my hand. So <laughs> perfect. Well, 